Today we have with us Jennifer Napier-Pierce, who is the host and executive producer for KCPW of City Views, and uh, she, uh, which is a hyper-local daily public affairs program that explores the news issues and ideas important to residents along the Wasatch Front. And um, she has worked as a reporter and anchor and news director at both KCPW and KUER. And she began working in radio in 2000. She's earned many awards from the Utah chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists and the Utah Broadcasters Association. And she received a degree in English from the University of Utah, which is where my own degree is from as well. Uh, once upon a time when I interviewed at BYU, they booed me for that, So, um, but that's okay, I've forgiven you. And, um, and a master's degree in journalism from Stanford, and so uh, she's a well-known local public affairs personality, and we're very grateful to have her with us today. So welcome, Jennifer. Good afternoon, could you guys hear me okay with this mic? Excellent. I tend to wander. I will try and stay by the microphone, but I can't guarantee anything. It's, it's the thrill for me to be here and to not to have had to prepare about uh, a, you know, an issue, a current event, uh, a policy discussion. I just get to come and talk about myself, which is really weird, but um, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity. So thanks very much for the invitation. How many of you have heard of National Public Radio, NPR? More than I thought. I don't know why I made that assumption, but <laughs> that's what it is. Um, I can tell you the first time that I heard public radio. How do I turn this on? Okay. Why I love radio. That's my title today. Um, the first time I heard a public radio story, I was in college. I was taking an education class. And my professor referenced something that they had heard on NPR that was um, germane to the, to the lecture. And I was like, NPR, what is that? At home, my family was all about Rush Limbaugh. And so it was like, what is NPR? So on my commute in to the next day to college, um, I flipped it over and I totally fell in love. I, I found a product that I just really identified with. I love the depth that NPR stories can go into. Um, I love the range of perspectives that you can find on National Public Radio. I love the craft, I mean, how well stories are produced and made. Um, and I love radio because you can take it anywhere and I can do my laundry or mow the lawn and still feel edified, feel smarter at the end of that chore. So radio is dear to my heart. But I didn't go into my career thinking I was going to be a radio broadcaster. Um, just by way of background, NPR is uh, a news organization. It sells programming to about a thousand affiliates across the country. And um, it has about 26 million listeners every week. To put that into pr some perspective, the largest newspaper in the country with the circulation of about 1.7 million daily is USA Today. So we have double the listeners, the, double the consumers of the largest daily newspaper. And so NPR is really a force to be rec reckoned with. Um, contrary to the political propaganda that you may have heard, particularly this election season, but in others as well, uh, public radio stations on average only receive about 11% of their bottom line from federal funding. Um, and this is called the Corporation for Public Bra Broadcasting. It is uh, the kind of the, the umbrella for both NPR and PBS on the TV side. So basically, federal funding is just a fraction of the bottom line for affiliates, but it is that significant 11% that allows public radio to be commercial free. So instead of a commercial station, which you probably have heard, there's a commercial about every four minutes on a commercial station. On NPR stations, we have this luxury of three minutes an hour. So it's a marked difference. And as a journalist, I mean, that's why I have chosen to be where I am in public radio is because we have this tremendous gift, this luxury of time to tell a story. And as a journalist, I mean, 
my brothers and sisters on the commercial side, they have 45 seconds, 45 seconds to tell a complicated story. My show is an hour long. I can spend 40 minutes with somebody and really ask some deep questions, feel like I get to know them, um, have a debate scenario where there are differing sides of an opinion. To me, that's so valuable, and it makes up for my meager salary in public radio. <laughs> I'm not making nearly as much as I would on the commercial side. Um, and yes, as Sarah Val, you may have heard of her. She's an author. She got her start in public radio. The demographics tend to skew on the older side. <laughs> All right. Within this NPR framework, there's this little tiny ship, an affiliate called KCPW, and that's where I work right now. Um, we are Utah's first and only commercial free news and information station. So all we do is news 24 seven. Um, like all NPR affiliates, we buy programming from the mothership NPR and we put it into various parts of the day. Um, Unlike our fellow public radio affiliates here in Utah, KUER and KBYU, KCPW is something called a community licensee. And what that means is we don't have uh, a larger institution to give us a buffer on the financial end. We are a totally lean, mean, um, financially cash-strapped, all the time little station. Um, but having worked at, at both a, a bigger station and a smaller station, this, the beauty of the smaller station for me is that there's no red tape. If I have an idea and I want to try something new, I can do it tomorrow. Whereas at a larger institution, there are hoops to jump through and policies and you got to get all sorts of okays. So in, in there, there's a give and take at a larger NPR station, there's security. At a smaller station, there's uh, nimbleness, there's flexibility, there's a lot of freedom, experimental, space to, to try new things. Um, so that's kind of where I am right now. Um, it's interesting to me that KCPW, frankly, has survived. We're uh, celebrating our 20th year on the air, um, which is quite a milestone. Um, let me just flip back. This is the Salt Lake City Library. This is us right here and we have a business office right here. They're tiny, they're just these tiny little places. Um, and here's the interior, this is the newsroom. You can tell it's no great shakes, it's tiny. And here's my executive level desk, I mean it's like this big. Um, and then we've got two working studios and that's pretty much it. But again, um, to me, the, the ability to, to try new things, to experiment, um, is worth it to me. To, not have my great office with the view. Um, at KCPW, as I mentioned, it's, we've been on the air for 20 years. I host a show called City Views. About a year and a half ago, um, I was at KUER, and KCPW called me up, and they said, hmm, how would you like your own show? And I thought, hmm. That's probably not going to happen if I stay at KUER because my great friend and colleague and mentor, Doug Fabrizio, is not going anywhere. And so I took a leap of faith and jumped to KCPW and started this brand new show. It's called City Views, as you mentioned. Airs Mondays through Thursdays, 9 to 10. It's live. It's a call-in show, so it's very interactive with people. Um, and really drills down on local issues, local grassroots kind of stuff. Um, things like local elections, like uh, a, an increase in the garbage fee, okay? These are things that really affect people's lives in a very direct way. Um, last night, I moderated a community forum on dogs. Okay, dogs are huge in Salt Lake City, and um, Mayor Becker is trying to put forward a proposal to add more dog parks, more off-leash areas where your dog can run around. Well, it's, it's stirred up kind of a controversy because number one, there would be a fee attached to it, and number two, who's going to enforce, you know, 
a rabid dog out there. And so, you know, joggers who are running through the canyon, they have concerns. People with small children, oh my gosh, a dog can just run up and, and maul my baby. I mean, these are serious issues for a lot of people. On the flip side, the dog hunters say, dogs love to roam free. They need more open space where they can do that in the urban setting. Um, so those are the kinds of issues that, um, that this show really targets, and it's fun. I mean, it, you, you get people's gut reaction when you're talking about um, glass recycling. You know, <laughs> they, they just want to know how is this going to affect their lives? How often can they do it? What kind of a fee is associated? Very grassroots level stuff. I also, though, take advantage of a lot of the scholars, the visiting scholars, the authors, uh, the musicians who are coming through town to give that what did I just do? I don't know. <laughs> Magic. Okay. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> um, I take advantage of a lot of people who are traveling through town because Salt Lake City gets some really interesting, creative, you know, uh, innovative speakers coming through. And I think these are ideas worth exploring. Um, and so there are some of those big ideas along with, uh, you know, who's going to collect your garbage next week. So it's a really fun kind of eclectic show. Um, never having produced my own show, there's a, a learning curve to it. I'm, you know, learning as I go, and that's part of the fun. Um, I feel like every single day I'm cramming for a final exam. I have a tightness in my stomach that rarely goes away. And part of that is um, I've decided because not all local issues deserve an hour. Sorry, you know, some people just can't talk for an hour. It's okay, I don't take it personally. So I've segmented the show, but it means that I have to do double the homework every night. So I've got two topics that I have to be somewhat conversant on any given moment. And that makes it hard. I mean, I, I read every book, the entire book, for any author who's coming through, or a play, I go see it, or I read the script. Um, if it's a musician, I have to get up to speed on their musical style and um, their background. In that way, it's so fascinating, but it's also like a, a sucker punch every day. It's like, oh my gosh, do I know enough? And most of the time, I don't. Fortunately, I don't have to know that much. I just have to ask good questions. So, um, just a little bit about how I got here. I, um, I did not intend to be in radio. I didn't intend to be a journalist. I worked for the high school paper and it was really fun, but I never even thought, I mean, it didn't even cross my mind that that's like something you could do to get paid for a living to do, <laughs> which is really weird. School counselors, whatever. Um, <laughs> So I studied English, thinking I was going to be an English teacher, loved politics, that was my minor. I did an internship in Washington, and just, you know, I thought this is all going to help me on my path to being a great literature teacher. So I go to a high school, and it was a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, I think I looked a little bit on the young side. And none of the other fellow teachers took me seriously. They would constantly ask me where my hall pass was. The students didn't listen. I mean, it was awful. And it just gave me such a sour thing. Because I, in my head, I had this idealized, I want to make a difference in the world. And what better way to contribute to a community, um, to the world, than to teach, you know, to, to pass on uh, uh, some knowledge onto the next generation. So that was kind of a letdown. But I got an internship at the Salt Lake City Council. That was my first job out of college. It turned into a job as a research assistant. And I fell in love with public service. I thought it was awesome. I really wanted to have something that made me think holistically about policies and um, issues that really affected people. And you know, if I could in some way improve a community, boy, I was going to do it. I was fired up. Well, I got married. <laughs> and um, my husband went to law school out of state. And so that meant we had to uproot. And I moved into a state where there the unemployment was above 10%. I'm an English major, okay? <laughs> I'm barely out of college a year. 
Um, I guess at that point I had three years experience, but I mean, I didn't have a lot of experience. Local governments, state governments, all the places where I thought I was gonna land, they weren't hiring, are you kidding me? 10% unemployment, no way. So I was lucky to get a job as a receptionist, okay? Um, it paid the bills, it put food on the table, it taught me what I didn't want to do, which was be a receptionist for the rest of my life. Um, and also, I worked in this biotech startup in the Bay Area. It was just when things were starting to happen with technology. It was an exciting time, and that, I think, is where I got this love for experimenting for trying something new, for reaching outside a boundary, for looking for new ideas. And so if that job taught me anything, it was that. I mean, I, I loved that environment where you could just try something, turn on a dime. If you failed, okay, try something different, tweak a, li a little bit. Um, and I think that's what got me hooked on experimenting. That also gave me a lot of time to, to explore, to think about what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to be a receptionist, didn't look like um, civil service was going to be in my future anytime soon. Um, so I did some volunteer work. I thought maybe, again, I had this idealistic idea. I want to make a difference in the world and help people. Um, so I thought maybe I'd go to law school. Excuse me. I, I, I almost went to law school. Dodged the bullet on that one. <laughs> that would have been a, a train wreck. Um, I, w I thought maybe at some point I wanted to be a doctor. But I was an English major, so I had no experience. So I worked at Children's Hospital Oakland, and I discovered I don't have what it takes to separate myself from these truly tragic stories. I can't help sick kids because it's too, it affects me too much. Um, I don't like to touch people. That's a good thing to find out before you go to medical school, you know what I'm saying? Um, I also took a ton of classes, and um, I remember I took a, a chemistry class at Berkeley yeah, it just didn't draw me in. I took, a, let's see, oh, I took a bioethics class at San Francisco State, which I totally loved, but I discovered I wasn't smart enough to be a philosopher. And number two, um, it, it wasn't hands-on enough. I needed something where I could get my hands a little more dirty. Um, and then I landed in a news writing class. And oh my goodness, the whole world opened out. But I was like, oh, I'm an English major. I know how to write. I'm a communicator. I like to ask questions. Ding! You know, it was like a little light bulb went off. And so, go back. Um, so I talked to one of my professors, and he said, go get some clips. Now, in journalism, you live and die by what you've actually produced. Well, I hadn't produced anything. And he's like, you need to get some experience. And so I went to my neighborhood newspaper, the Redwood City Tribune, and I said, I need a job. Are you going to you know, take a chance on me? And they said, no, but we'll give you the chance to do a story and see how you do. And so I did a story on spec, and they liked what they saw. So I did a couple more, and then they gave me a job. So I got my first job in Redwood City, California, which was great. And I worked there for a year, just long enough to know that I knew nothing about this new field I was entering. And so I decided to go back to school um, and study journalism formally. How I got into radio. Um, so I had this print experience. I learned to work on a deadline, which I loved. I learned to talk to people that I knew nothing about. and. You know, at first, that's kind of scary to ask the stupid question and not feel like I am the stupidest person ever. But you have to get comfortable asking stupid questions in this field. I mean, it's just part of the job. Um, so I got some print experience. I went to school. Um, and then my life changed again. Had a baby. OK, that kind of throws a little bit of a loop into your career path. Um, after a while, my husband was an attorney in the Bay Area. Not a good thing. I would not recommend that for anyone. <laughs> um, he worked at a high-powered law firm. We never saw each other. So we needed to make a life change. And we love Utah. I mean, Utah's super easy to live here. It's affordable. Um, we love the mountains. It's close to family. So we decided to move back. But that kind of left me like, OK, I've got an internship at the LA Times. I've got clips from a little uh, bi-weekly in the Bay Area. 
where do I go from here? And I can't really dive into something. I've got this you know, six month old baby. So freelancing, yet again. I'm freelancing for magazines here in Utah, um, but it gave me a lot of contacts as well. Um, I also do started doing a little bit of volunteer work, making some connections, networking. I don't care what field you're in is important. You need to make time for that to go out, talk to people, listen to their um, experience, seek their advice. Um, and then we needed a down payment for a house. And so I thought, well, I'm going to just take a temp job at KCPW because I love radio. And they were looking for somebody for two months. And so at the end of the two months, they were like, I mean, it was an administrative job. It wasn't even a journalism job, but I needed the cash. They were like, so you're a journalist? I said, well, you know, I'm kind of, sort of. I'm still starting out, but yeah. And so um, that turned into a job. They said, great, be a reporter. I knew nothing about radio. And in fact, in grad school, I took one broadcast writing class and hated it. Like, I hated it. I don't know what, I don't know what this professor was thinking, because it's so much fun. But he just, he just couldn't make it happen in the classroom. And I was so bored. And he never gave us a microphone. How do, you, how do you take a broadcast class without the tools of the trade? It was just a ridiculous class. And I regret spending thousands of dollars on it. Um, <laughs> so here I am as a reporter. I know the journalism part of this equation, but I really know nothing about the technology. And so it was a very steep learning curve. Fortunately, I love gadgets, um, so it was fun to learn. But I can't say that my first editing jobs were very clean. <laughs> I hope they were somewhat listenable. I, don't, I can't even go back and listen, because uh, it would be too painful. But that was my reporter job. I covered schools. So in that way, I felt engaged once again in the community. I got to go to these really boring school board meetings and help translate the action into a story that people could understand. Have any of you guys been to these public meetings like city council? They can be snoozers, right? I mean, they can be bad. And they're full of jargon. And so um, as a journalist, as a reporter, I felt it was my job, my responsibility to translate some of that for the listener. Um, and I found that really fulfilling and felt like I was contributing, yes, once again, that ideal of contributing to a community. So then um, the Gulf War broke out and our news anchor left. She just decided she'd had it. So I became the morning anchor. And anchoring is so different from reporting. It's a completely different skill set. Um, you have to sound confident. And I remember um, when I first got this job, my boss said, that newscast sucked. I'm like, I know, I know. He goes, you have to sound more confident, authoritative. And I go, I'm not confident. I can't sound that way. Um, it takes a lot of practice to get up to speed on the issues, to feel like you are speaking to one person in the audience and explaining to them what is going on in the most factual, comprehensive way that you can. It does take practice. And so that was fun. I did that for three years. Um, and thanks to my wonderful husband, he took care of the babies while I got up at 3 a.m. <laughs> um, I probably, I, there's no way I could never, I could have never done it without a willing partner in this. Um, after about five years at KCPW, I wanted to try something different. I'd been stuck in the desk, in the studio. I hadn't been going out in the field. I was tired of it. You know, I, wa I wanted to be a reporter. I wanted to be out in the community. And so I quit. Cold turkey. I didn't have another job. But there was this new technology coming online. You may have heard of it, a podcast. Um, nobody had heard of this. Uh, how long was this ago? Uh, six or seven years ago when I started a podcast and everybody in the world was like what are you doing with your career but for me it was like this totally creative space it mixed up um, the craft of radio um, with the science of radio I really got to into the tools 
Um, I was surprised how many people would talk to me because I thought, you know, without the label KCPW or um, uh, San Carlos Inquirer or uh, Utah Business Magazine behind my name, nobody would ever talk to me. Well, I found out that that's absolutely not true. People want to tell their stories. And so for me, it was a really great learning experience um, in independence and you know, figuring out, yeah, I can do this on my own. I don't have to have a station behind me. I never really tried to make money at it. I think if I had stuck it out, I probably could have. Um, at the time that I decided to fold, like the City Weekly gave me podcast of the year. I mean, I was getting some recognition for the work and I probably could have turned that into some dollars with some sponsorships, but I just thought, do I want to spend my time marketing or do I want to spend my time telling good stories? And so I decided, okay, I'm going to fold this up um, and I want the stories to be broader. That's not to say that podcasting didn't give me um, an effective outlet. I covered a story, somebody called me and said, this is a story that you probably should pursue. It was uh, a parent of a friend of a friend, I don't know. Anyway, they found out I had a podcast. They found out I was a journalist. They said, we've been talking to our insurance company. They won't pay for our child's cochlear implant, which is some sort of ear operation that it helps you hear. And um, as they explained it, it just seemed very unjust and it seemed like a story that needed to be told. This is a huge company that was refusing to pay. And so um, I went to the insurance I asked for an interview, they granted me the interview, and by the end of the day, they had changed their mind. They reversed the decision. I was a podcaster. I mean, I, was, I'm, I wasn't, a, I didn't have a huge broadcast range, but that showed to me the power that journalism can have to affect change in one person's life, policies, communities, um, and it really renewed my sense that I, w I was committed to this field, I loved it. So um, I had connections, it's a small media market. I had a lot of connections with the reporters at KUER, which is at the University of Utah. It's kind of the flagship uh, public radio station in Utah. And they said, hey, we're looking for um, an afternoon host. And I said, no, I'm not interested. Um, and they came back maybe a month or two after that and said, hey, we're looking for a news director. And that is something that I had done at KCPW as well. And I thought, okay, I'll give it a try. So I became the news director at KUER. News director, if you don't know, it's like the editor of a newspaper. It's the person who makes all the assignments. It's the person who edits all the stories, fact checks. It's the person who sets the news agenda for the day. Um, it's a fun job, it's really fun. You also have to manage the budget and do all this staff, you know, like employment management stuff. Bleh. Not my bag. Um, I really, I like people to go out and do their own thing. I don't want to oversee what they do that much. Um, so after about 18 months, I don't know if this was a good or a bad thing, but it is what it is. My husband got um, a job with the governor. He's the general counsel for Governor Herbert. And at the time, somebody had encouraged him to apply. And I said, oh yeah, go ahead, whatever. I never in a million years expected him to get this job. And it's not because he's, I mean, he's a fantastic lawyer, but the fact is it's a political appointment. And I, he's not political really. And he's especially not Republican. And so I just thought, oh yeah, go right ahead. You do what you want. Um, and so, I'm covering the Elizabeth Smart trial. I just come out of the courthouse for a break and the phone rings and it's John and he's like, so are you sitting down? I'm like, no, should I be? He said, I just got a call from Gary Herbert and he asked me to be his general counsel and my jaw just dropped because the implications of this for my career were huge. Um, again, I had encouraged him to apply never thinking he'd actually get it. Uh, so um, he got it. And so then I had to decide what I was going to do. As the news director of an entire newsroom, 
we are, our job is to hold people in power accountable. It's our job to make sure that uh, we hold people's feet to the fire, ask tough questions. And I knew that there was a built-in conflict of interest for me personally, knowing that my rent was going to be paid by the state of Utah. And so um, I resigned a couple of days later. Fortunately, KUER, I mean, they did not want to let me go, which I'm so grateful for. And I stayed on another 18 months with them um, to uh, guest host their Radio West show, being very clear to steer away from those policy issues that I couldn't touch. So all of a sudden, I found myself covering a lot of health, a lot of science stuff, um, a lot of other uh, topics that were very interesting to me, but not directly political. And so in that way, it's been a little bit weird. Like, I'm still in that place. When KCPW came along and offered me my own show, I said, well, there's an asterisk next to my name because there are things that I can't touch right now. Um, I cannot be critical um, of the governor's stand on climate change, okay? I can't. And they said, with your own show, you can set the agenda. And so that's the difference. I was the news director. I was telling people what to do and what stories and, and helping them shape the, the angles of the stories. Now it's all mine. And so I can talk about whatever I feel ethically um, is appropriate for me. So it, it, in a lot of ways, it turned into a good thing but I'm still struggling with it. He's still at the governor's office. I, you know, we're going into the fourth legislative session. Who would have ever thought? Certainly not me, not him either. Um, we've gone over some of this. Uh, why I love journalism, it's civic-minded, it's all about community, it's about building community, it's about exploring issues, and again, it's about asking the tough questions. How many of you guys have heard of journalism referred to the fourth estate? Okay, the first estate is the executive branch, second legislative, third is the judicial. The fourth, we're not elected, but we, rep, we really try to be the watchdog over these other three branches, these other three estates. And I love that about my field. It's, it's very community-based. It's also language-based, which I have a facility with, I mean, which is great. I love punctuation. I'm a nerd, okay? I love um, writing a sentence. I love language and um, the twist of a phrase. I think it's, it's just terrific. I also love the deadline. It's a love-hate relationship, I can tell you. Um, five minutes before a show, and I need 20 more minutes uh, to make this good. It, you know, it is what it is. But I, t for some reason, the pressure environment works for me. I also like to ask a lot of questions, and I like to ask hard questions. And that's probably why I'm feeling just a little frustrated right now that I cannot be part of these really hard-hitting political discussions. I can talk about big esoteric issues like um, why we don't have more involvement in, uh, on election day, but I can't really hone in on specific policies at this point. Also, I love journalism because it is something new every day. And perhaps I'm just shallow um, because I cannot be an expert in any field. But I know a lot of stuff about a lot of things, a little bit about a lot of things. And for me, that's very fulfilling. I love to learn. And journalism really provides um, a great outlet for that. Um, I want to just share maybe just one story. Um, as we talked about, these are Oh, maybe I can't. Can I click on those? Oh, ho! Oh. It's magic, whoever's back there. Um, oh, they didn't save my media files. Don't worry about it, it's all good. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the stories that I do. Um, back in April, there was this uh, appellate court decision that came down in favor of panhandlers that talked about panhandling as speech. I had on um, the civil rights leader, Brian Barnard. Um, he was an attorney who represented these panhandlers, super articulate, great guy. Sadly, he just passed away um, within the last couple of months. Um, but those are kind of the, the grassroots issues, news-driven types of shows that I really like. 
Um, I also like big ideas. As I mentioned, um, some of the local authors will come through, national authors will come through. Um, I actually interviewed a, a colleague of yours, Dr. Karpowitz. He did a study on group dynamics and specifically about women and their, uh, the way they communicate or interact when they're feeling outnumbered in a group. I thought it was so fascinating and he came down and I had a woman executive come on the show to share her experience. Um, those are idea kind of shows that uh, also are really compelling, really fun to dig into. Again, I've got 40 minutes with them, so it's great. Um, I also like to do a lot of profiles, people in the community who are making a difference. Um, back in July, I interviewed Judge Tyrone Medley, and he was the first and only African-American judge in the state of Utah. There's only been one, and he just retired. And so it was fascinating for me to hear what civil rights was like when he got here in the state and the barriers that he had to break through his career. I love hearing stories about real people. Um, and again, the time is so valuable to me to be able to spend 40 minutes with, um, with a, a single person. So, is journalism for you? Can you tell a story? Do you like to tell stories? Do you like to share information? Do you like to um, learn something and give that information to somebody else? I mean, I think that's a really, um, not everybody wants to tell a story. Not, there are a lot of people who like to just listen, and that's okay. But journalists need to be able to crea create a narrative, uh, to craft a storyline. Also, are you concerned with facts? There's one thing to be able to write well. It's another thing to be able to write factually uh, in a way that makes sense. If you are a creative writer, don't be a journalist, okay? That stuff is made up. And we've seen some crossovers, sadly. Some journalists who think, oh, wouldn't it be, this story be even better if I made up this little fact? And, you know, they're always caught. They're always caught. So, um, that's something that you might want to play with in your skill set. Do you enjoy talking with and listening to other people? If you are an introvert, can you still be a reporter? Absolutely. But you still need to get over that fear of talking to somebody that you have nothing in common with. Um, and that happens to me all the time. And actually, it's really fun because I get to, to be in somebody else's shoes for just a little while. And I think that's really fun. Do you write fast? Speed. Speed counts in this industry. Um, quite often, I mean, I, the reporters in my shop, they only have like three hours start to finish to find a story, to get the interviews, to cut the tape, to voice it, to mix it all together. It's on the air. Um, that kind of stuff takes practice. It gets your blood pumping for sure. If you do not like writing on deadline, Journalism is definitely not for you. And I can say that not every story is that quick of a turnaround, but there's enough of it that you have to be very comfortable with that news cycle. And again, you can't be a technophobe in radio journalism particularly, but more and more print journalists are also taking out cameras. They're also taking out their little recorders because it's a multimedia world out there. And so if you're afraid of technology, if you don't think that you can push the right button at the appropriate time, this may not be the field for you. One last thing I want to leave with you. Um, as you consider, you know, is journalism a possible option for me? Um, will you be satisfied as the messenger, as the communicator, instead of the policymaker? Okay, you may not know this, but journalists are ethically bound by a code of ethics, the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. As it says, we should shun secondary employment, political involvement, public office, service in community organizations if they compromise journalistic integrity. And so if you find that you tend to really like being in the mix of, of something, being behind the scenes, perhaps considering public office, journalism really is not the place for you. Because as a journalist, my civic involvement has to do with 
my work. It's not casting a vote, it's reporting on somebody else casting that vote. Giving voice to the voiceless, that's the power that I have as a journalist. I don't have the power to actually approve a budget or um, cast a vote in favor of increased dog leash, off leash areas, you know what I'm saying? So you might wanna think about that. I know that you guys are a policy oriented group. Having said that, you know, I've, I've covered plenty of politics and I've covered a lot of debates and I've moderated all sorts of events and sat through those long, boring city council meetings and school board meetings. And so in that sense, I feel like that is true civic engagement as well. Civic engagement can come in many forms. So if you want to get started, these are some tips that I have found as I've interviewed people for jobs, as I've hired interns. Um, the resume speaks volumes. Why? Because a journalist, a journalist's power is credibility. And if you make errors, it takes away from your credibility. Where do people know how to believe what you're saying? If you're accurate in your language, you're using the proper words, you are error free. And if you can't do that on your own resume, I'm not gonna trust you with a story to do that, okay? Um, also, I have, surprisingly, I've had a couple of people come in and ask me for internships, and they don't read the newspaper, and they don't keep up on current events, and they don't watch TV news. I mean, it's, it's a very peculiar thing. If you want to be a journalist, you need to be a consumer of journalism. You need to be up to date on what's going on in your world and in your community. Um, I can't think of one working journalist, an editor, uh, a producer, a reporter who would hire somebody who isn't as excited about the news as they are. Um, news is what fuels us. It's uh, a driving force in the industry. Again, I've learned that you have to have something to show and maybe that's just a paper. But now is a great time to get involved in your school newspaper. Um, I'm sure there are some local community rags out there Work for free for one piece or you know, get 50 bucks or whatever. Um, at least it'll give you something to show someone that you have some skill in the field. Life experience. I love people who have a story to tell me about their lives because that tells me that they know how to tell a story. They can spin a yarn and make it interesting. So, um, I would encourage all of you to think of something really interesting about your life. <laughs> and if you haven't had something interesting yet, go get something interesting so that you have a story to tell. And then again, just being able to communicate, to empathize, to um, ask people in power hard questions and ask people who are powerless some, uh, to reveal some personal something about I mean, those are both ends of the spectrum are difficult for people to reveal about themselves. Um, and so it takes some time to develop the skills, to know how to talk to somebody, to know when to ask that question and when it's a little bit too soon to ask that question. I have hired an opera singer. Um, I've hired a PhD in biology. Um, I've hired a student with study abroad experience. Again, these, these, skill, these skills, or these life experiences all build interpersonal skills. And so again, if you haven't had something interesting happen in your life, uh, go find something. Um, I just wanna finish up with, uh, oh, wait, stop. Can you go to the last slide? Thanks. <laughs> um, a quote by Ira Glass, who is a terrific, a terrific radio reporter, interviewer, host of This American Life. Sadly, one of the problems with being on public radio is that people tend to think you're being sincere all the time. Public radio people like to joke. There's a sense of humor there. We're not always sincere. We can be very shallow, just like the rest of us. <laughs> and with that, I guess I'll just open it up to some questions. If any of you have questions about what I do or um, insights into the field. Okay, 
yeah. Hi, my name is Courtney Carter. Thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, one of my first questions, the only one I'll ask right now, is when you got into radio, did you feel like a lot of your communication skills had to be modified for the different format? And did you just have to practice um, more focusing on like a vocabulary versus like your facial expressions, like that type of thing? Like, how long did that take? A long time. Um, the broadcast writing style is very different from the print style. Um, so that took uh, some adjustment because in print, you can go on and on and on. Again, even though we have, you know, three or four minutes to do a radio news story, it still needs to be condensed. And you tell a story very different than you would write a story. And if you have read the newspaper, you know what I'm talking about. So there's a, there's a distinct difference there. Um, I wouldn't say that my vocabulary has changed so much. Um, Maybe I don't use as many big words. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I'd have to think about that one for a minute. Um, but yeah, I mean, it takes some time, and it certainly takes some practice. I would say um, the live hosting part of my job right now has taken a lot more practice. I have to, before I was just looking for a sound bite or for an extended something that I could throw into a piece, um, now I am part of that story, that narrative, and so my question has to be fully formed. I can't just shoot off the cuff and, and think that they're going to know what I'm talking about, like I used to do in both print and just as a radio reporter, um, because all I needed was their voice. I didn't need my voice. Now I have to use my voice, and that's taken some practice, too. Yeah. So talking about building up a portfolio and, and getting clips, um, are, are blog posts an acceptable form of, of like clips? Do, do people see that as a good, uh, as a good piece, I guess, or a, a piece that's representative of your stuff, like your writing and? I, I mean, it's a good question. I think um, it depends what your blog is. If your blog is an online diary, I would say no. I mean, really, th there doesn't show any sort of journalistic values to that. If, if your blog happens to be um, uh, an opinion, but you're supporting it with certain facts. I mean, at least that, as an editor, I could see um, how your brain is working structurally, how you would put together a, a news story. So I, I would say yes and no. It really depends on the nature of your blog. Um, and everybody has a blog these days. So uh, what's distinctive about it? And um, the other thing that, you know, I love reading blogs because some of them are very entertaining and great. Uh, bloggers rarely have an editor. They don't have a second pair of eyes to look at the content. And they don't have to adhere to an ethical code where they are telling truth, right? So, um, you know, you can just write whatever you want and you can be very creative and fluid, but journalism has that extra layer of truth to it. And so, I don't know. So it's better to get your start by going out like you did and going to a community newspaper or something? Or, I mean, you have a perfect environment here. You have a, a school newspaper, you have KBYU, you've got a lot of opportunities as students, I would think, to, to kind of build a portfolio. Mm -hmm. So this is a really broad question, but do you have a particular interview or issue you covered, something that sticks out in your mind that was a favorite piece you ever worked on? Oh my goodness. Um, I love when, I don't know if in the social sciences they call it looping in the, you know, where you really are connecting with the person that you're talking to. Sometimes that happens in the interview setting and it is just so exhilarating to feel like you have figured out this person or you have been able to figure out what makes them tick. Um, I had that happen with um, Terry Tempest Williams who is uh, a very famous Western author. She writes a lot about the environment. And after our interview, she sent me the nicest email and just said, it felt like we were sitting at a coffee shop just talking. And for me, that's like the biggest compliment I could ever get is to feel like we had 
a connection. We, had, we were truly communicating. That doesn't always happen, um, but that's one that comes to mind. Other questions? Class is over, so thank you very much for the attention. I appreciate it.